Sharman is a sister of Shafa Siddiqui, whose preemptive prosecution case took place in Atlanta, Georgia, where her family currently lives. She lives in Michigan and is pursuing graduate studies in social cultural anthropology. She is currently preparing to conduct her dissertation research on the impact of U.S. government war of terrorism on Muslim American youth. She is a member, she is a member of Families United for Justice in America. Charman also serves as a chairman, as a member of the Prisoners and Fa Families Committee of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. Greetings of peace. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna just read an expert, I mean, excerpt that I've been working on. Um, some of you have heard it loud, loud. Steve is motioning you loud, loud. <laughs> okay, so, um, so on an early spring day in 2006, my apartment was filled with the warm aroma of Turkish coffee. I was reading response papers from students when the phone rang. And my mother grimly proclaimed what happened to Shifa, my little brother, in Bangladesh. She said, your Abba called, Abba is in dead. He's saying Shifa has been kidnapped. He doesn't know where is Shifa. He's gone. What happened? Tell me what exactly happened. What did Abba say? I asked. My mother was silent and did not respond to me, as if she was unaware of, she, what, of what she just uh, communicated to me. Um, she says, your Abba is saying, she paused in silence again. He's saying some people kidnapped Shifa from the car. Emerging from the bed and pacing across my apartment, I, I asked, who kidnapped him? How did they kidnap him from the car? My mother continued, your Abba doesn't know where, his, where Shifa, they took him away. He, he, he can't find Shifa. They had guns. He's gone. Who was in the car with him, I asked. Exhaling deeply with iciness in her voice, she recapped again. My mother kept repeating, you can't find him. He's gone. With such numbing certainty and silence scattered in her speech that it made me shiver and angry at her ghost-like inexpressiveness. So I hung up the phone and called my dad, who upon receiving my phone disintegrated like an undisciplined child wailing, Ma, I have lost everything, my life, my treasure is snatched away, they have taken away my heart, my soul, ma. I could hear him thirst, uh, thirsting his chest, crying in agony, not knowing where his son was and amplifying in tears, he persisted. Everything is lost, Shondi, which is my nickname. They have taken away your brother, our little precious gem. They took him at gunpoint, ma, they, could, they took him at gunpoint. I shuddered. Hearing my 65-year-old father crying helplessly was a very rare occasion. He's someone who always kept a restrained disposition and taught us to be calm and patient at, at any adversity. Now he was falling apart like a boy who has just lost his, lost his best friend. He's calling out for his mother. Ma is an affectionate term that fathers sometimes use to call their daughters. But, but this wasn't a time he was, he, was calling, he was showing his affection. I felt he was literally calling out for, for his mother to ease his pain. Feeling ineffective and unable to console my father, I said, pray to Allah, but inshallah, we'll find him. Handicapped with thousands of thoughts, my mind raced about the possibilities of where and how to search for my brother. Who's going to help us? Who should I call? Thoughts, questions, and words muddled my mind. Not knowing where my brother was and where to look for him, I frantically started to brainstorm who to contact. When my father gave the phone to Happy, my brother Shifa's wife, Happy called out my name, Appa, which means, his, which means sister. She tried to complete her thoughts, but exploded in tears. The vacillating rhythm of her weeping kept bursting into my ears. For how long? I don't know. As I listened to her fall into deep wailing, photos of her wedding flashed through my mind. She looked jubilant, with sparkling eyes and smiles in wedding pictures. Realizing how her dreams and happiness had been just shattered, I too felt like weeping. They were just married two weeks ago, my brother Shifa and Happy. They had planned to begin a life of bliss and adventure, like so many young people, so, like so many young and newly wedded couples. He had saved up money for work from working in Atlanta so he could go, to, go back to Bangladesh to marry the girls of his dreams. He considered attending college and desired to establish a blossoming life together in the US. I don't know how much time had passed before Happy spoke again. If you had only seen how they, her words muddled in gusting tears. Yes, I asked, asked softly. How they grabbed him from the car. They didn't even let him call Baba. 
They pulled him out by the shirt, snatched the phone away from him. They were so inhumane. He didn't do anything. She broke into wheezing and whimpering. Her cries were racked with pain, punctuated by gas compressing her lungs in suffocation and preventing her from making coherent sentences. All her dreams had been paralyzed. I kept, I kept thinking what it must have been like for her to witness her husband taken away right before her eyes. To where? No one knew. What it must have been like for not, what it must have been like for her not being able to do anything and not knowing where he was. How would you feel not knowing? How would you feel when persons unknown devised a meticulous plan to subject you to experience the feeling of not knowing? How would you feel knowing that someone deliberately orchestrated a plot forcing you to witness your own hopelessness? Repressing myself from breaking into tears and unable to find words to comfort her pain, I softly said, Happy, this isn't a time for crying. We have to be strong. We have to first find him. Can you be strong? Let's pray to Allah and ask for help. As I kept searching for words to comfort her, I heard my uncle in the background asking Happy to give the phone to Lee Tong, the chauffeur who was driving them. Appa, Lee Tong screamed into, the, into my ears. Yes, tell me, I asked frantically. Appa, what a tragedy just happened to us. Yes, can you tell me what happened, I asked. We were gone shopping, Shifa Bhaiya, Bhaiya means brother, and Happy Appa went shopping. As soon as we approached the main gate of the neighborhood, two jeeps blocked us from the front and the back, and eight or nine men surrounded the car, pointing guns at us. Some had machine guns. Appa, Appa, I couldn't do anything. I felt helpless. He broke into tears. Stunned in silence, I could only mutter, how did they know Shifa was going out at this hour? I don't know, he replied. I asked, where was Happy? Where were you, uh, what were you doing? Appa, if you have only seen, and Bhaiya, you know he hasn't been, his health hasn't been well. They told Happy to not to move from the car. She was scared and crying. What could have she done? I couldn't do anything, Appa. He, reco he recounted, quivering. Couldn't you call Abba, I asked. How could I? They took away my cell phone, my car keys. They, they told me to get out of the car. And two men held me back from doing anything. While the leader pulled, pulled Bhaiya away out of the car, I couldn't do anything, Appa. They said if I tried anything funny, they would shoot me. He responded in a voice breaking. Who were they? How did they get inside this neighborhood? I asked. They bribed the guards. Appa, you know how it is here. They said they are taking Shifa Bhaiya for ransom. What? These were thugs, street thugs? I exclaimed. No, no, Litton expl ex explained. Uh, they, they said they were with the DGIF, NSI, Bangladesh Intelligence. Oh, it's the military, the ones who have been calling and harassing Abba for days. Tell me what exactly happened, I said in angry voice. When they blocked the car with guns pointing at us, they told me to get out of the car. They pulled me out and they asked Bhaiya to get out of the car, but he did not get out at first. He told them, let me call my Abba. You know, the chief of police is our family friend. Maybe you'd like to talk to him. But the man snatched the phone away from Shifa Bhaiya, pulled him out of the neck and punched him in the stomach. What? I asked. They punched him many, many times. He pitched forward, choking from the punch. Then they blindfolded him, handcuffed him in the back. They pushed and dragged him to the car because he wasn't moving, almost tearing his shirt because he wouldn't move. They pushed him, kicked him. They were pure, they were pure evil people. He continued to tell me the details of what happened that night. DGIF, the military intelligence of Bangladesh, had been harassing my father for months, wanting to talk to my brother Shifa. They would call asking my father, where is your son? We, we heard he went to that, this country, that country. They would make up this kind of lies. I'm not sure what they wanted, but, but, but my father always offered to meet, meet them with my brother. He offered to hold conversations with them every time they called, but they never actually wanted to talk, neither with my father nor my brother. What is, what is it that, that they wanted? They just wanted to terrify us. They intentionally contrived, well in advance, how they were going to call, harass, and terrorize my family with unfounded claims, lies, and questions just so they could monitor our conversations, movements, travel patterns that we engage in as a result of their fear tactic, psychological terror. If they, if they could instill enough fear in us, that is in my brother, maybe he would leave and go into hiding. This way they would have their evidence and perhaps he was up to something. When they failed, they had no choice but to kidnap him. They kidnapped him under the direction of our US government and kept him in an undisclosed location for days before the FBI brought him back to the US in a secret CIA rendition aircraft. 
How would you feel if someone willfully schemed to, ter to terrify you? How would you feel knowing someone purposely conspired to inflict pain and agony in your life, to, des to destroy your hopes, to crush your dreams, to maim your marriage for life and shatter your family? How would you feel being tortured with the thought of not knowing for days? How would you feel being subjected to trans-state violence and denied your humanity? These were the beginning of our sleepless, foodless, numbing, chaotic four days and nights of nightmare, unknowing and hopelessness, while we desperately contacted organizations, media, journalists, anyone who would help us find my little brother, Shifa. So my brother rep represented himself at his trial from jury selection to sentencing three years later, without any legal knowledge. He stood before the court wearing his khaki prison uniforms because what's the point dressing up for a few days? Why send up an image to the world that you have been kept well, fed well, when you were tortured in solitary confinement for over three years before trial? They accused him of, they accu uh, they accused him of supporting an organization engaged in liberating Muslim land from Indian occupied Kashmir. The organization, however, did not exist and was not designated as a terrorist organization in the U.S. weeks after the FBI arrested my brother. They manufactured a case against my brother and his friends just because one of his friends made a trip to Pakistan to visit his family. So when Shiva was convicted uh, and now sentenced for 17 years in the communication management unit in Marion, we started receiving phone, call, phone calls from all sorts of media around the world because the government prosecutors instantly broadcasted their victory, gloating and praising themselves for a job well, well done. This was the first Muslim terrorism case in Atlanta, Georgia. How could they not gloriously publicize this across the world? The Harvard-educated lawyers won their first huge terrorism case. For what? Fighting with a naive high school graduate. This was one of their biggest cases. The government finally put behind one of the most prolific translators of an online Muslim publication website. But how would you feel watching someone boast their victory over someone who wasn't their match? Wouldn't you like to meet someone your own size or your own level before you glorified your victory? But when you, leave in the, when you live in the world of George Orwell and Ray Bradbury, and you are maneuvered like a chess piece on a chessboard, you are, blinded, you are so blinded with the insolence that you believe your victory over the week is a game well played. Thank you.